Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare, an online learning community. Good morning and welcome back to Black Bear Forge. Today I thought we would get back to our look at the tools from the Master Mirror Find, and specifically Plate 13, looking at the spoon augers. That's these down, down here. There's a set of five of these. I think I'm just going to make one. The process will be essentially the same for all of them, only in different sizes. Now, I am sure the originals were probably made out of wrought iron with a forge-welded steel cutting edge. I'm going to go ahead and make today's project out of a piece of coil spring. I'm trying to make tools that function like the originals. I'm not really trying to make museum-accurate replicas or historic reproductions. So I've already cut a section of this coil spring off. And this is about a 5 8 diameter coil spring. So that's somewhere in the 17, 18 millimeter range. I doubt that I'm going to need all of this, but I'll go ahead and straighten this out and draw out the different parts of it to, to get it the size that I want it. These are drawn at a 1 to 2 scale, so this shows as being about 5 8 of an inch wide. So that would be an inch and a quarter for the finished piece if we have to double that. And I think there's plenty of material in this piece of coil spring to do that, so that's what we're going to aim for and make the largest one of these first. And then I'll scale to make the others. But let's go get this hot, straighten it out, and start making a spoon auger. I'm going to go ahead and start straightening this with just a bending fork. Sometimes bridging a gap like this helps straighten things out. Next I want to isolate the mass for the spoon part of the bit. The spoon portion of this is about 5 inches long according to the drawing. So I'm going to start with about 3 inches and I think that will be plenty to stretch it that far both in length and to be able to get the width we need. The drawing shows the shaft on this being about a half inch square with heavily beveled corners. And it looks like I've gone just a little bit too far, so maybe this won't be the large one. Maybe we'll end up making the next size down. So the slight design change, I need to draw this out about eight inches. I'm going to turn it around and go ahead and cut it off to make the, the top end, whatever you want to call that, the part that goes in the handle. On all of these spoon augers, this handle end is a four-sided rectangular taper.
Now there's no mention in the book of the originals having any form of a maker's mark on them, but I'll go ahead and stamp this anyways and that helps guarantee that nobody will mistake it for an antique. Before I move on to the working end of this auger, I would like to take a moment to thank Skillshare for making it possible for me to share my passion in the art of blacksmithing with you folks out there watching YouTube videos. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes to choose from. They have classes in all manner of subjects from making videos specifically for YouTube or short films. It's not about your camera. It's all about the person behind the camera. Photography, including product photography. They have classes in graphic design, drawing, website design, and other computer and internet-based subjects. I've even found a few classes on blacksmithing on Skillshare, so those might be worth checking out. Skillshare Premium costs less than $10 a month, and right now the first thousand people that click on the link in my video description will get a free trial offer of Skillshare. But now, back to work. Just want to get that nice and flattened out, then we'll spread it. Now I am sure once you've made a bunch of these things you get pretty good at knowing what this has to look like before you start to put the spoon shape in it, but I'm not real sure exactly what this profile should be to get the spoon shape similar to what's in the book. So I'm going to go ahead and just clean that up a little bit on the grinder off camera to make it symmetrical, and then I'm going to do the spoon shape and then we'll see if it needs more grinding after that. My guess is it will. I think these outer corners here are probably a little bit too squarish. It probably needs to be rounder than that. And maybe I'll grind a little round in there, but we're just gonna see. It's all kind of experimental for me. It's been years since I made one of these, and they probably weren't exactly like the ones in the book anyways. Actually, I made some of these for somebody a few years ago. They didn't like them, they returned them. The reason they didn't like them wasn't because they didn't work, but because they weren't dead on accurate sizes exactly a half inch, exactly three quarters of an inch, whatever it was he had ordered. And my personal opinion is that that's probably the way the originals were. I find it hard to believe that all around the globe people were working to a standard at that time period. Instead, I think somebody would have had a drill bit, they would have drilled the hole they needed, and then made the other piece to fit that hole. And I've seen chair makers working with hand tools today that that's exactly how they work. They drill a little sample block, they sit at the shaving horse making the legs or the spindles, and they test fit those to that sample block, and then they know they're gonna fit the holes they've drilled with that drill bit. I think it's much more likely that blacksmiths were working to an approximate size instead of some exact standard that their customers expected to be down to a thousandth of an inch. That's something we think of today. We do everything based on a measurement. We don't really worry about making part A fit part B. We make them all fit the ruler, and I don't believe they used to work that way. I think they had some standards set by a tool often, and then they made everything fit that standard. Didn't matter what the size was as long as it was sufficient for the use at hand. Anyway, that's just my thoughts on the matter. I'm not a tool historian. If you know for sure how they used to work, if you've actually studied this, if you're an archeologist or you've recreated the time period working with tools like this, I'd love to hear from you down in the comments section. But if you were Viking Age Smith making a whole bunch of these, you'd get pretty good at it. So I've cleaned that up and I've taken another look at the image in the book and it shows these feathering out quite a bit from the center. They're much thicker in the center. 
So I'm going to go ahead and put an edge on there somewhat. I don't have the exact size swedge I would like. And this has to curl up at the end as well. That yeah, may be a better swedge than I gave it credit for. In the book it shows these as about one third of a circle. So that's not bad. That's actually not bad. A little bigger than I thought I was going to end up with out of this piece of material. As I say, I'm not going for specific dimension in modern terms. Now I seriously doubt that Viking Age Smiths had an assortment of swedges and swedge blocks they probably used a wood block with a specific hollow burned out in it or something like that. Or maybe they had some other tool that was curved. And quite likely they were just better at doing this stuff because they had those limitations and they were used to working with those limitations. But again, my intent is not to make a perfectly accurate historical reproduction. It's just to get a feel for how the tools might be made. But more importantly, to then be able to do some work with tools that were made in that manner. Yep, it's a little bit crooked. I don't know if you can see that or not, so I'll heat it up one more time and straighten it. Then I need to straighten it without messing it up. So hopefully I can do that. Yeah, that seems to have worked. I've got that in the vermiculite so it can slow cool. That way it'll be a little easier to file or grind to get it all just right. Then it'll be time to harden and temper it. But I'm not going to get back to it till tomorrow so it can cool completely down. I don't have to rush it at all. Plus it's getting a little bit dark in here even though it's only 3 o'clock and it's daylight savings time. So that means the weather's moving in. I see some snowflakes out the window. Supposedly we're going to get somewhere between 5 and 12 inches tonight. We'll see if that really happens. Usually they're a little bit overzealous in their forecast. But one way or the other, I will probably spend tomorrow inside and may not get back to this for a few days. So I'm going to go ahead and call that part one. Pick it back up with part two, hopefully in three or four days. And then we will harden it, temper it, 
And I'll see what I'm going to do about a handle. The book is a little bit vague on handles. They have one example that isn't from this collection. It's from another museum. So it may or may not be the same kind of handle. But we will talk about that a little bit when we get around to putting the handle on this. And of course, that's when we'll try it out to see if it works and get some final close-ups of it so you can see what I came up with. In the meantime, I hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses. Don't forget that the first 1,000 people to use the Skillshare link in the video description get a free trial of Skillshare. And I'll look forward to seeing you for part two.